Restore what was lost on the way, and be thou my hope in the waiting. In the silence, I cry out your name, your holy name, treasure thou art. Oh, still be my vision in the darkness. Restore what was lost on the way. And be thou my hope here in the waiting. In the silence I cry out your name, your holy name. Oh, oh. High King. Victory won. May I reach heaven's joy, O oh, bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Still be my Restore what was lost on the way. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Cornerstone Lectures. We're glad to have you come out on this perfect day for a lecture series. What better to do on a rainy October morning than, uh, than come listen to uh, the exposition of God's Word. It is a delight to see you. We want to thank you for bearing with a lot of the COVID restrictions and all the, the things that we've had to dance around. I want to thank especially those who have already served breakfast. I hope you've enjoyed the little treats. Well, we are delighted today to uh, gather together to listen to God's Word, and especially as we think about God's glory. What a remarkable topic to, to, to fix our thoughts on as we bring God glory day by day and week by week. 
You all should have a schedule nearby. Uh, we'll try to run very closely to this. After this first section, we will take a brief break, just a quick stretch break. Um, and if you must use the restroom, you can do that quickly. But those first two you can see are pretty much back to back. The restrooms are behind you. Uh, the men's room over here, the women's room in the lobby there. Uh, we'll be cleaning those fairly regularly. Um, so for your comfort, we do have a book table once again. We want to thank Brian and Jennifer and Evangel Christian Stores for bringing those books here. Dr. Van Drunen is a, a prolific author. He's either written or edited something like 11 books and numerous journal articles. Uh, this one especially might be of interest if you if you're more interested in what you hear today than you were before, then this is a, a book from which some of this material is drawn. Uh, those are available there. If you're struggling with ethics in some aspect of your life or your children or your aging parents, uh, he has another book, Bioethics in the Christian Life, a, a great helpful resource. And then uh, a timely book released earlier this year, Politics After Christendom. I don't know this one's available, but you can find that elsewhere. Uh, those are just a sampling of some of Dr. Van Drunen's writings. At the end of today, we'll have our normal question and answer session. So through the day, grab a three by five card and jot your notes and your questions down, and we'll have a basket to turn those in that uh, might facilitate a question and answer session with Dr. Van Drunen. I want to open in a word of prayer and a, a brief scripture reading before I introduce Dr. Van Drunen. Our Heavenly Father, we ask today that as we've gathered to look at your word and to think about your glory, that you would be magnified, that your name would be glorified as we reflect on all of the things that you have done and even as we think about your character itself. Father, we pray for Dr. Van Drunen. Uh, that you would give him strength to, to speak faithfully according to your word and help us who have come this morning to listen intently uh, that we might be instructed in your word and bring glory to your name. We thank you for this opportunity and we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, the glory of God, as you can imagine, spans the whole scriptures but one, one particular passage I want to draw your attention to as we begin is that uh, we have this hope and promise as well as God works in us. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Well, I want to now take a moment to introduce Dr. Van Drunen. Dr. Van Drunen is a professor of, or the professor of systematic theology and Christian ethics at Westminster Seminary, California. He was one of my professors, and it's been a joy this weekend to spend time with him after some, I think, probably 16 years or so since I started seminary. Dr. Van Drunen is a minister, an ordained minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church preaches and travels regularly, uh, not just throughout the country, but throughout the world, to, to teach and to preach. He serves on committees in the OPC and has uh, specific interests in political theory, or political theology, and biblical studies. So I hope that these, these talks bring your heart to a greater level of, of honor and glory as we seek the Lord even this morning. Let's welcome Dr. Van Drunen. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was uh, very kind, and uh, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, it seems a little surreal to actually go somewhere and uh, do something like this. Uh, as Pastor Falcon has said, I, I ordinarily travel quite a bit. This is my first trip now since um, early March. Uh, lots of things canceled. Uh, but I was just thinking back to that. It, it was actually a, uh, it was a church conference in Minnesota in early March. And uh, traveling through airports and 
as if nothing was going on and uh, shaking hands and eating right next to people. And uh, about a week later, things were totally different. <laughs> so um, I'm uh, glad to be back uh, uh, on the road and uh, to be in a place I haven't been before and to meet you. And uh, it's great to hear some of the story of, of this congregation. I know some of you are not from this uh, church, but um, I appreciate the invitation and I look forward to our time together today. Uh, our topic is the glory of God, or God's glory alone, which is one of the, uh, one of the five Reformation solas, these, uh, kind of these slogans of uh, the Reformation to summarize the theology and practice of the Reformation. And uh, in some ways, the idea of God's glory alone is, uh, it, it kind of stands out from the other Reformation solas, you think about sola scriptura, scripture alone. We, we, we understand, you know, uh, how important that was for the Reformation. And then uh, Christ alone and faith alone, grace alone. And those get to the heart of how we understand our salvation. Uh, God's glory alone. Uh, it's, it's such an expansive topic. I mean, there's practically nothing in all of scripture or in all of our theology or all of our practice that doesn't somehow have something to do with the glory of God. And we might just want, might take a moment uh, as I begin to reflect what, what are we even, how, how do we even focus uh, a series of lectures on this very, very big topic? Now, when we talk about the glory of God, we could mean uh, a divine attribute, Right, so we, we speak in our theology about the attributes of God. We'll say that God is just, uh, God is wise, God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing. These are things that characterize God. And one of the, the, the attributes of God is that he is glorious. It's one of the things that characterizes him. And uh, as one older Reformed theologian put it, he said that... Uh, when we refer to God's glory, we refer to an attribute that reflects and reveals the perfection of all the attributes. So what this theologian was getting at, what he was suggesting is that when we refer to God's glory, you, you think about all the attributes of God in their absolute perfection. And that's God's glory. Right? It's as if it's that thing which brings together everything which God is. All the excellency of God. In fact, this theologian also said that God's glory is the infinite excellency of the divine essence. Everything that makes God perfect. Everything that makes God great. Uh, this comes together uh, to make up God's glory. Now, this, this theologian also said that when we speak in these terms, we're referring to the internal aspect of God's glory. And in fact, it's really only God alone who knows and understands this. Only God actually understands the infinite character of his excellence. We have these very small, finite minds. There's no way that we can understand God's glory the way God understands his own glory. Only he knows himself in his infinite perfection. However... As this theologian, you probably wonder, who is this theologian I'm talking about? His name was Edward Lee, uh, spelled L-E-I-G-H. He's not a really well-known, famous theologian, although he was fairly important in his own day in the 17th century. So he was ref as he's reflecting on this, he says, now, it's, God's glory is not just this internal, this internal uh, uh, aspect, but it also has an external aspect. You see, God expresses his glory in his creation and in all the works that he does in this world. So even though God is internally glorious, known to himself, he is also, and, and you might say in this sense, you, nothing could be added to his glory, right? I mean, if he is, if his glory is the infinity of his perfection and excellence, then nothing could be added to it because he has everything already. And yet, he has been pleased to make a world that will reflect his glory 
the all-glorious God, the infinitely perfect God, has chosen to make a world that will reflect his glory, to mirror his glory. He chooses to glorify himself by making this world and doing wonderful things within it. And so, as you might imagine, it's this second aspect of God's glory that we're focusing on today. We want to think about how God has made himself known in this world, how he has revealed his glory to us, and how we might have some kind of participation in that. Now, Hebrews 1 verse 3 calls our Lord Jesus Christ the brightness of God's glory, or the radiance of God's glory, depends what translation you're using. Of course, there are all these wonderful ways Scripture speaks about Christ, but this is certainly, it seems to me, this is one of the most beautiful and one of the most profound. He is the radiance of God's glory. And this reminds us that if we want to see God's glory, to understand God's glory, to enjoy God's glory, then our focus must be Christ-centered. There is no appreciation or knowledge of God in his glory apart from our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, even as I say that, as I suggest that, it's also important to say that this is Trinitarian. Uh, and I hope you'll appreciate the Trinitarian character of what we're doing today. Christ is the radiance of his Father's glory. So when we see the glory of Christ, we see the glory of the Father. And yet so many times in Scripture, we read that the Holy Spirit is the one who makes Christ's glory known. And so to know the glory of one person of the Holy Trinity is to know the others. One makes known the glory of the others. It's a wonderful thing, and I hope we'll see kind of how that works out as we uh, go through the material this morning. Well, in these first two lectures, what I would like to do is to take you through a kind of a journey through the scriptures. And then our final two lectures, uh, I will turn to thinking about this idea of how do we live for God's glory in our, in our present world. But this, uh, these first two lectures, uh, I want to tell you the biblical story in a certain way. I mean, if you think about, you know, how, how would you summarize the story of Scripture in two hours if you were given that responsibility? There are lots of different ways you could do that. It seems to me that telling the story of God's glory in the Scriptures is one way to capture the entirety of God's great plan of redemption uh, for us. And that's what I would like to attempt to do in these first two lectures. And as I do this... I would also like you to think about why is the revelation of God's glory in this world and in the scriptures, why is that good news for you? I don't want this just to be an intellectual exercise of seeing how scripture speaks of God's glory, but I also want you to think about why is this good news for me? Because I want you to see that this is good news for you. This is the gospel story. This is one way of telling the story of the, of the Christian gospel. And in this first lecture, you're not going to quite see it. In fact, I'm going to suggest as we focus on the Old Testament in this first lecture, that the Old Testament sort of leaves us hanging. How exactly is the revelation of God's glory good news for us? And it's only with Christ's coming and the fullness of revelation in the New Testament that we really see it, that we truly understand that. So keep in mind that though God wishes to be glorified alone, he doesn't want to be glorified in a way that makes him lonely. He doesn't want to be lonely in his glory. He wants to share that glory with a people of his very own, and that people is you. And so this is your story and not just the Lord's. All right, so let's go to the Old Testament and to begin thinking through the story of God's glory in the scriptures. And I think the best way to do this is to focus upon the pillar of cloud and fire that we uh, begin to read about uh, shortly after the exodus from Egypt. All right, so that means I'm kind of ignoring Genesis 
which is a terrible thing to do. Um, but keep in mind, of course, that you can't, you know, you can't, you can't even understand what's going on in Exodus without remembering that God had made these great covenant promises to Abraham that he was, he was going to form a people for himself and send a promised Messiah through the line of Abraham. And of course, Abraham's family went to Egypt and were enslaved for hundreds of years. And the beginning of Exodus tells us the story of how God brought his people out of Egypt. And that's where I want to pick up the story. So shortly after they leave Egypt, almost immediately after they leave Egypt, we read that there is this giant cloud that Israel sees above them, and it never leaves them throughout their decades of being in the wilderness. What was this cloud, and what did it do? Well, Scripture tells us that at night, the cloud looked like fire. It was like a giant fireball in the sky. And it was so bright and so large that it illumined the way that Israel could travel at night. I think about that. I mean, they're out in the desert. There's no artificial light. And they're going through the desert, a place they've never been before, probably pretty hazardous. You need some pretty good light to travel safely. This cloud was so big and so bright that they could travel through the desert, no problem. Scripture also describes this uh, as, uh, as like an imposing storm cloud. There are obviously different kinds of clouds. You wouldn't think someone coming from Southern California would have much of a knowledge of clouds, and I don't, I don't really claim to have much of a knowledge of clouds, but I did grow up in the Midwest, and I'm sure there are uh, at least a few Midwesterners here. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon at all on summer afternoons to have, you know, it'd be a beautiful day, and all of a sudden you see, you see a giant storm cloud coming, and within a very short time, all of a sudden it's pouring rain. And it seems to me that part of the description, uh, the, the description that we find in the Old Testament, it reminds me of those kinds of storm clouds, not the kind of low-lying things that you've got out here today, but out of nowhere, an imposing storm cloud. For example, in Exodus 19, right, so Exodus 19 is when Israel comes to Mount Sinai. Exodus 20 recounts the giving of the Ten Commandments. So Exodus 19, they arrive at Mount Sinai. And uh, this, uh, this chapter says that the cloud covered Mount Sinai as a dense cloud. It says it was like smoke from a furnace. And it brought forth thunder and lightning. So this is not just a nice puffy white cloud on a beautiful day. This is, this is an awe-inspiring thing. So what did this cloud do other than uh, be very imposing? Well, ordinarily, it went out in front of Israel. That's one of the things that we read. Uh, it, it showed Israel their path of travel. They had no idea where they were going. No one had ever been there before. So it went in front of them, and they knew where to go, and they knew when to stop. Sometimes uh, we read in Numbers, sometimes uh, uh, the book of Numbers, sometimes the cloud would stay in, you know, just for a very short time. They'd sleep in one place and get up and go. Other times it would stay for a long period of time in one place. So the cloud was their, it was their GPS. It was their navigator through the wilderness. But we also know that this cloud, at least on one occasion, moved to their rear. It moved behind them to serve as a protective wall. That took place in Exodus 14. Remember, after Israel went out from Egypt, and the Egypt, Pharaoh had regrets, right? Pharaoh said, we can't let them go. We're going to go get them. And we read that this cloud moved behind Israel and served like a wall to keep the Egyptian army from harming them. So there's a lot that we can, uh, just what I've said so far, uh, brings out something of the impressive character and the importance of this cloud for Israel's life. And yet, what made the cloud so magnificent was that it was the cloud of God's glory. Most specifically, it was 
it's portrayed as the dwelling place of God. Uh, that God is in that cloud. And there are all sorts of theological qualifications here, right? You know, God doesn't really live in clouds, but he sort of does. Right? So uh, it's very interesting. I, I, I'm, I was saying this to Pastor Falconer before we got up here. He asked about, you know, a text he might read before we started. And I said, I'm going to talk about tons of different texts today, but I'm not going to talk about any of them for very long. All right, so... Um, I just want to refer you uh, to Psalm 97 and 99. I'm not going to read them, but if you, if you care to, uh, if you're thinking about things to read about later today or tomorrow, uh, Psalm 97 and 99 are very interesting. And uh, they seem to be talking about this cloud. They, obviously, this was, these psalms were written uh, long after Israel's experience in the wilderness, but they seem to be reflections back on the cloud and using the imagery of the cloud to describe God and his glory and his kingly reign. And one of the things that we, that we see here is that this, this cloud is the place where God's throne is. God dwells in this cloud, in this glorious cloud, and his throne is there. And what the, the sense that we get is that in some way, this cloud is like a model or a replica of God's heavenly court, God's heavenly throne. Right? I mean, even, even that we know is kind of metaphorical. I mean, God, God is everywhere. God rules everywhere. And yet heaven in scripture is portrayed as the special place of his glorious dwelling, the place where his throne is. And yet the cloud is portrayed as, well, that is where his throne is as well. And so you might think of this. Here's Israel being led by this, this massive, glorious cloud. The throne of God is in that cloud. God is there. That's what makes it glorious. And you also get the sense, actually, that when Israel constructs the temple, or the, the tabernacle later, as they're going through the wilderness, they construct the tabernacle where they'll offer sacrifices and worship. And that tabernacle is also portrayed as the place of God's throne. Right, that this is actually uh, as, as the, the Ark of the Covenant and the cherubim are, are, are constructed. That this is God's dwelling place. So it's as if you have these layers reflecting God's heavenly glory. The cloud reflects God's heavenly glory. That's the place of his dwelling. And then they build the tabernacle, and that is an even closer, uh, an even more intimate place where God dwells in the midst of his people. One other thing I would, uh, one last thing I'd like to say, just as a kind of an introduction to this cloud, is that scripture associates this cloud with the Holy Spirit. It's a, in some ways you say this is kind of a complex imagery, a complex set of images to describe the cloud. Uh, but it's very interesting, you, you find this, uh, for example, uh, in Isaiah 63 and Nehemiah 9. So these are actually texts that written a long time later, looking back. And these texts describe the cloud leading Israel through the wilderness. And it says, the Holy Spirit was leading you. That cloud is in some mysterious way a special revelation of the Holy Spirit of God. And so you have all of these, all of these things being brought together to say this is no ordinary cloud. This is the cloud by which God draws close to his people, God instructs his people, God guides his people. And there's some more we need to say about that as we now sort of see how the story develops. So, I want to pose this question now. The question is this, is or was the revelation of God's glory, was that good news to Israel? God gave this cloud to them. Uh, what were they to think of this? Uh, were they to be glad and rejoice that this cloud was sent to them? Or was there a darker side uh, to this cloud? And as you may suspect, since I'm asking the question, the answer is, well, it's sort of a mixed story. It was, 
if, if we were Old Testament saints, if we were Israelites back in this time, I imagine we would have had very mixed feelings about the presence of this cloud in our midst. At one time, this cloud would be a great blessing to the people of Israel. It would fill them with joy. And then at other times, this cloud would be the means by which God judged his people. Sometimes God would put people to death from this cloud. This is a cloud that not only in some ways would draw Israel into this intimate, blessed presence of God, but other times this cloud would drive Israel away from God, expel them from his presence, and be a sign of curse, a sign of judgment against them. What, were, what was Israel to make of this? Was it a sign of intimacy or a sign of exclusion? Let me give you some details now to see how this works out. All right, so let's pick things up in the wilderness. Israel arrived at Sinai. Exodus 19, I mentioned this a moment ago. And the cloud draws near. Right? They come to the foot of Sinai and the cloud descends. It descends onto Mount Sinai. It gets closer to where it has been in the past. We read that the cloud covered the mountain. And Exodus 19, 17 says that Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. All right, so Israel's coming to Mount Sinai. The cloud is coming down upon Sinai. And it's portrayed in Exodus 19 as the meeting of God and his people. And you think about that, they haven't really had this kind of meeting before. God did mighty works to rescue them from Egypt. God protected them through the Red Sea. God had been leading them now for a short time through the wilderness. But God hadn't exactly met with his people yet. This sounds very good. This sounds like good news. God drawing near to his people. And in fact, Exodus 19 verse 5, in the, in the same story, here it says that God, that Israel was God's treasured possession. It was his very own people, his treasured possession. As if God had made all the nations of the world. And yet Israel was his very own. So this all sounds very, very good. And yet do you remember some of the other things from the story in Exodus 19? God says to Moses as the people draw near to Sinai, put a boundary around the mountain. No one actually can come up that mountain. In fact, not even any of your animals should come up that mountain. Anyone comes up that mountain, that person has to die. That doesn't actually sound like quite the welcome mat that we might have expected given some of the other things that we've just been reading. And in fact, as we keep reading the story, we find first, I mean, just Moses goes up. Only Moses is allowed up on that mountain. And then a little bit later, uh, 70 elders from Israel are allowed to go up on that mountain and to have communion with God. So there is, there are a handful of people who actually get to meet with God in the cloud. <laughs> Moses and some of the elders actually entered that cloud. They entered as if the, the very throne room of God. But the vast majority of the people, they were excluded. On pain of death, they were not to approach. And so right away, you get what I would suggest is a kind of a mixed message. What is Israel to think? Are we welcome in God's presence or are we not? This is a tension that begins to develop. And as we'll see, it, it continues as Israel's story continues. All right, so Israel is at Mount Sinai. Moses gets the law. He delivers it to the people. And finally, uh, Israel is uh, kind of now set to uh, move on. Now, you might remember that one of the things that, uh, that God gave to Israel, as he gave the law to them, what we call the Mosaic law, uh, was instructions about building the tabernacle. 
So if you read the latter part, uh, uh, the latter chapters of the book of Exodus, you find detailed instructions about the building of the tabernacle. Um, if you read this, you might find it hard to read, actually. I mean, I actually find it somewhat hard to read because you've got all these detailed instructions and it's kind of hard to picture in your mind what's actually being described. But it was obviously very important that Israel get this right. All right this was going to be the place where the people worshipped God. This was going to be the place of their most intimate fellowship with God. So at the very end of Exodus, we read that Moses finished building the tabernacle. And Exodus 40 verse 34 says, The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now that's close, right? It's one thing for the cloud to come down a little ways and settle on the top of Mount Sinai. But now the cloud has come all the way down to the ground. I mean, this tabernacle is not on the top of a skyscraper, right? This tabernacle is sitting on the ground, and the cloud comes all the way down, and it fills that tabernacle. That's how the book of Exodus ends. It has come really close, you think, wow, God is really drawing near his people now. He's really, he's really becoming intimate with his people, right? And then the very last, <laughs> the very last thing Exodus says is, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the very fact that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle means even Moses couldn't go in. It was too much even for him. He could go up on Sinai, but he couldn't go in the tabernacle because the cloud was there. There is something about this cloud which keeps people away. Even the chosen leader of God's people couldn't enter the, the tabernacle at that time. So we, we, we end the book of Exodus, we're kind of hanging on, wondering what's, what's going on here. And we go to the book of Leviticus. Everyone's favorite book. Uh, which is another a book that can be hard to read sometimes because uh, we're just not sure we know what's really going on uh, in the book of Leviticus. But one thing that you might want to keep in mind, if you, if you give it a try to read through Leviticus, which you should do, uh, rem you should note that, the, that Leviticus 1 picks up exactly where Exodus 40 leaves off. It's one story. Don't be fooled to think that this is a totally new thing going on. It's actually... You know, if, if you didn't have Leviticus written in, you know, uh, on, on, on a new page in your Bibles, it could just be the continuation of the story. Because you see what's going on is that the tabernacle is finished. God's glory fills the tabernacle. Uh, now we need to know what's going to happen in the tabernacle. Israel needed to know that, right? Wh what are we going to do here? And so what Leviticus begins by describing are the sacrifices, the tabernacle is to be a place where sacrifices are offered to the Lord. And so these, one chapter after another early on describes the various kinds of, of offerings that Israel uh, was to, uh, to offer up to God. But then you might, if you're, if you're, if you're alert and attentive, then you'd ask, well, uh, if the glory of God you know, filled that tabernacle at first, if that is such a holy place that not even Moses could go in, uh, who's actually going to be able to offer these sacrifices? And so we come to Leviticus 9, and we read about the ordination of Aaron and his sons to be priests. So uh, it, it, it's like a continuous story here. and In a sense, one, one problem is being answered by subsequent chapters. So now we know, given Leviticus 9, now we know how it's possible for Israel to worship or to serve in this tabernacle. They're going to be priests and they're going to offer sacrifices. And these sacrifices are going to cleanse Israel from their sins that they can actually be in the presence of their holy God. And at the end of Levit Leviticus 9, right when Aaron and his sons are ordained to the priesthood, we read once again that the glory of the Lord appears to all the people and they shouted for joy. So 
we kind of get this sense that the cloud at the end of Exodus descended into the tabernacle for a short time and left. And then the priests are ordained to go and begin their service offering sacrifices. And the glory of God returns. The cloud returns again. But now it's not to exclude the people so much as uh, to be with them. And the people rejoice because now they have, there's worship that can be offered in this tabernacle. It seems like things are getting better. The relationship with God is getting more intimate. God's glory has drawn close. But we keep reading. And we come to Leviticus 10. And maybe you remember what happens at the opening of Leviticus 10. Here are uh, two of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu. Newly ordained. And remember, remember when you were ordained? It's, uh, you know, you've, it's a good moment. You're excited. Nadab and Abihu were just ordained as priests. And they decided they were going to get creative. And they offered this incense to the Lord that he had not told them to offer. And God strikes them down from the cloud. So they didn't get to enjoy their, uh, you know, whatever high they felt from being ordained to the priesthood. It lasted a very short time. I'm smiling, laughing about this, but this is a serious thing. I mean, there are only, what, six priests ordained initially, and all of a sudden they're down to four. God strikes down two of Aaron's sons because they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord. It wasn't even, it seems, that God had told them not to do what they did. It's just God, hadn't even, God had not told them to do it, and they decided to do it on their own initiative, and God struck them down. Well, is this presence of God with his people a blessing or a curse? God draws near, and yet when they sin against him, God will strike down one of his anointed priests. What are we to make of this? Well, it's interesting just to stop for a moment, stop the kind of historical thinking here. Uh, in, in the book of Romans, uh, early in chapter 9, if you remember Romans 9 through 11, Paul reflects a lot on Israel and particularly on the fact that so many of, of the Jewish people of his day had not believed in Christ. And Paul's reflecting on how, how, do we, how do we square that with the promises of God? And Paul says at the opening of Romans 9, he talks about all the privileges, all the blessings that Israel had. And he said, there, theirs were the fathers, meaning like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, theirs were the promises. He says, theirs was the glory. And you think, well, what does that mean? We know what he's talking about when he talks about the fathers or talks about, you know, the promises. But theirs was the glory. And I have to think that, he, that Paul was thinking about the cloud, He's thinking about this glory that accompanied Israel and even entered their tabernacle. It was a blessing. What other nation in the world had the glory of God draw so close? What a privilege. And we, we can understand how Israel was terrified of losing that. And in fact, in, in Exodus 33... If you might remember, uh, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, Israel made this, the golden calf, and they, they engaged in idolatry just after God had entered the covenant with them. And Moses comes back down, and God is dealing with Israel. When, and God says to Israel, uh, you go on ahead. You, you go on to your promised land, um, but my presence is not going to go with you. And that's... That's horrible news for Israel. They cry to the Lord. Like, Lord, we can't go if your presence doesn't go with us. All right? Once they had an experience of God's glory with them, they did not want to lose it. They knew that it was a blessing. They knew it was a privilege. They knew it was their protection. And yet, what we have seen already, most dramatically with the story of Nadab and Abihu, is that a holy God cannot endure a corrupt people. That's the basic problem. God draws near to his people, but his people are so sinful. And it seems like 
It's the times when God draws closest that his people become most rebellious. God draws closest to them at Sinai, and what do they do? They make a golden calf. This is your God that took you out of Egypt. God draws close. His glory comes to the tabernacle. And Nadab and Abihu, they immediately offer false worship to the Lord. And see, this is the problem. The cloud itself becomes the way that God executes judgment on his people. The cloud of blessing becomes a cloud of judgment. And so we have this, you might say, a terrible dilemma. Israel, you might say, Israel can't live with it and can't live without it. It can't stand the thought of God's glory leaving them, but it's terrified when God's glory draws close because of their sin. And so we come... We come to the uh, sort of the end of the story of the wilderness wanderings, and there's certainly nothing that seems very settled. More questions than answers, it seems to me. And so we wonder, how is it going to go when Israel enters the promised land? Finally, after 40 years, they cross the Jordan under Joshua and begin to settle this land that God had promised them. And it's interesting that uh, when we get to this point in the story, we stop hearing about the cloud. Uh, It seems like just like the manna. You remember, once Israel entered the land, they stopped getting the manna every morning. And it seems the same was true with the cloud. Uh, The cloud just, we stop hearing about it. Uh, And Israel is there in the land, in this holy land, but no cloud. Well, we have to wait a long time before Uh, we meet the cloud again, but we do meet it again. We meet it again when Solomon builds the temple. David, King David, wanted to build the temple, but he was a man of blood, and God said, your son is going to build it, and so Solomon does. And uh, we read about this early in 1 Kings. And uh, in 1 Kings 8, we also read about this in 2 Chronicles 5. Uh, God, uh, Solomon finally finishes the temple and there's this triumphant return of the cloud after hundreds of years. And it's almost as though we have this repeat of what happened with the tabernacle when that was completed at the end of Exodus. Solomon uh, brings the Ark of the Covenant into the temple in Jerusalem and we read the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The cloud. (laughs) You might say, well, what cloud is it talking about? Well, you know now, right? You know what cloud it's talking about. This is that cloud of glory, that imposing storm cloud. It enters into the holy temple and the priests have to flee because they can't stand, they can't endure being this close to the glorious holy presence of God. And yet, the story continues and Solomon blesses the people. And we read in 2 Chronicles 7, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down, and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord. If there's a high point of the story of the people of Israel in the Old Testament, this might be it. Here they are, they, you know, God had promised for years, not only they have a promised land, but that he would choose a particular place where there would be a temple, where God would be worshipped by his people, and here the temple is finished, the glory of the Lord appears, the people fall with their faces to the ground. I mean, that's, um, that sounds very gross to us. But these people were so overwhelmed by the glory of God that they could do nothing but fall to the ground. And yet they praised God. They gave thanks to God. This was as good as it gets for the people of Israel in the Old Testament. 
And yet, maybe you've read the rest of First and Second Kings or the rest of Second Chronicles. And it's not very good reading. I mean, it's good reading in a way, but it's not happy reading for the most part. This was the high point, and that suggests that there are lower points coming. Israel continued to be a rebellious people. Solomon himself, the son of David, the wisest man on earth, toward the end of his life, he fell into rebellion, fell into idolatry of all things. And the kingdom shortly thereafter is divided into the northern tribes, the southern tribes. And it's just a story, First and Second Kings is largely a story of rebellion against God. And as you read the stories in these books, you can't help but think back to what God had said in the law of Moses, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy. God had threatened his people, if you are rebellious against me when I bring you into the land, I'm going to bring all these curses against you. I'll have you defeated by your enemies. I'll bring drought, bring famine, bring disease. And eventually, God said, I am going to exile you from your land. Now, that was really the ultimate curse. And you read through First and Second Kings, and you read about a lot of the, a lot of the curses are coming. Right, there are a lot of times that they get defeated by foreign, foreign armies. There are times when God brings terrible drought on the land. And so the people are suffering under the weight of their rebellion. But finally... Finally, at the end of 2 Kings, we read about exile. Well, first, God sends the northern tribes off into exile under Assyria. And then, some years later, God uh, puts Judah, particularly Jerusalem, uh, they go into exile in Babylon. Uh, you might to think of this story in the terms in which we're, we've been thinking about it. God's glory could not abide with a rebellious people. God drew close, but God's glory is repelled by the sinfulness of Israel. And so we come to this story of the exile. And one of the ways we can see how terrible exile is, is through the cloud. Now, we don't, we don't read about what happens to the cloud after that incident in, you know, when, when the temple is built. I, I, I read you that brief uh, account when the, the cloud reappeared at the building of the, of the temple. We don't hear about the, the, the cloud then again. Apparently the cloud left as the regular temple ministry began. But one of the, the, one of the prophets of Israel at the time of, of the exile was Ezekiel. And so when you read the book of Ezekiel, you're reading about events that are taking place during the period when, when Judah is being taken into exile. Uh, and in Ezekiel 8 through 10, in, the, in a series of accounts that take place there, Ezekiel is seeing visions, and he's seeing visions of the cloud. So this is not, what he's seeing is not what the people who are actually living in Jerusalem are seeing. But in a sense, you might say Ezekiel is seeing what's really going on. Right? What is not available to the naked eye, but what, is, what God is doing behind the scenes. Let me describe briefly what Ezekiel sees in Ezekiel 8 through 10. First, Ezekiel saw the glory of the God of Israel in the temple court. And you might say, well, that's good. That's where God's glory belongs, right there in the temple. But then the next thing that Ezekiel sees, he says, the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been and move to the threshold of the temple. This glory of God, this, this glory cloud of God begins to move. And this doesn't seem good. There it is. It had been in, in, the, te in the temple, under the cherubim, 
And now it moves to the threshold of the temple uh, to a you know, place where you might leave the temple. And then you keep reading and it says, Ezekiel says, the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. And while I watched, Ezekiel says, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. You see what's going on? God's glory is leaving the temple. The cherubim, you know, they, they made images of these cherubim. Ezekiel sees real cherubim, and they get up and they fly away. This is what's, go this is what's really going on in the exile. The glory of the Lord is leaving Jerusalem. The glory of the Lord is leaving his people. The cloud gets up and leaves. God casts his polluted people away from his holy glory. That's what the exile is in a nutshell. Well, at this point, we're not quite at the end of the Old Testament story. We're almost at the end. We're right about the end of our uh, first session here. So let me just close by um, making a brief comment about what happens after the exile. Um, we know that Israel went into exile and uh, for 70 years they were there. Uh, and after 70 years, uh, King Cyrus of Persia gave us decree that the people could return. Now we know actually from history that a great many of the people remained. They remained in Babylon or remained in Persia uh, uh, in their place of exile. But a small number of them did return to the promised land. Now, the people who returned had some great things that they could hold on to because God had promised, that he'd promised all the way back in Deuteronomy that he would restore them after exile. And you have prophets like Isaiah that offer wonderful uh, prophecies about uh, how God is going to bless his people wonderfully after their time of exile. And so uh, you can imagine that the godly Israelites who are returning to the land must have been eagerly expecting God to do something great again in their days, to bring the glory of God back Maybe they were expecting to see the cloud again. In fact, that was almost surely their hope. That would have been really good news to see that cloud. And yet things didn't really work out the way that they might have expected. They returned. They rebuilt Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple. There was a new temple that they built. But you know what didn't return? The cloud. The, you know, there's, there's no new Exodus 40 scene. There's no new Leviticus 8 scene. There's no new 1 Kings 8 scene. There's no return of the cloud. And in fact, if you read the, the, the account of this in, in Ezra 3, um, and he also has some reflections on this in Haggai 2. Haggai was a, a prophet of the, uh, during the return uh, from exile. Uh, we, we, we learn that some of the old people who were there when the temple was rebuilt, the people who remembered from their youth the original temple, they weren't joyful when the temple was rebuilt. They cried. They remembered the glory of the first temple. And it's as if this, this new temple was just a pale reflection of it. Uh, it just didn't, it, it wasn't the same. God's glory had not really returned. They were back in their land. That was good. But things were still wrong. Things had not really been made right again with their God, and they knew it. They had to wait for something better. They had to know that those prophecies from Isaiah, they had not yet been fulfilled in their day. Something greater had to happen. And so I end this lecture by posing this question again. Is God's glory good news for his people? Is the draw, drawing near 
Is the revelation of God's glory actually good news? It's impressive. It's imposing. But is it something that should bring you joy? Well, we need to wait to the New Testament to get, to get the answer to that question. And uh, the nice news is that the answer is yes uh, to those questions. So uh, I'll, I think Pastor Falconer will come up and uh, in a few minutes again, we'll pick up the story in the New Testament. Well, thanks, Dr. Van Drunen, for that was a pretty good overview of the Old Testament in one hour, wasn't it? <laughs> well, we can expect more of the same in a few minutes. We've got about a five-minute break, stretch, greet one another, use the restroom if you need to, and we'll start again in five. Thank you.